On September 17, 1804, the Lewis and Clark expedition killed an animal none had seen before. Clark described it as a curious kind of deer of dark gray color, the ears large and long. It had a tuft of black hair about the end and jumped like a goat or a sheep. They decided to call it a mule deer. Mule deer have always intrigued me, but as I get older, my connection to the animals gets more complicated, more nuanced. It's not the hunting alone, it's the bigger picture. It's what these animals represent to the landscape, to my home. Averaging six and a half feet in length and built to bound rather than run, the mule deer is unique in its physical attributes, as well as its origin. Having evolved exclusively in North America, its range extends through the entire Rocky Mountains, from Alaska to the four major deserts of the Southwest and Mexico. Though they are members of the Cervidae family, like moose and elk, these ungulates fit within two subspecies, mule and black-tailed deer usually brown or gray in color, with males crowned by antlers. Mule deer have been known to reach speeds up to 45 miles per hour and migrate hundreds of miles in the course of a season. But there's a problem. In the last three decades, this symbol of the West has steadily declined in numbers. 20 years ago, our mule deer herds were so large and so abundant that we never could have imagined they would decline to a point where we were really concerned about them. There has been a great deal of concern about the status of mule deer um, in recent decades where population declines have been identified. And there has been, of course, a, a search for explanations as to why this may be happening. Some of the hypotheses that we have to explain the declines in mule deer uh, range from um, human development, uh, urban areas within winter range, the barriers they have during migration, predation is a potential factor that people think about, and changing climate and how that affects their winter and summer range. It's a complex problem with a myriad of different factors to consider. But to put it into the simplest terms, the amount of available habitat has deteriorated. And the habitat they do have is less capable of sustaining them. It's unlikely that we will ever return to mule deer numbers that existed in the middle of the last century. But we can hope to create conditions that allow healthy mule deer populations to grace the Western landscape for future generations. It will not be an easy task, but it's a critical one. The mule deer, iconic of this massive Western landscape, is a bellwether. If we see this major decline in a major ungulate species such as mule deer, we can pretty much assume that there have been other effects, deleterious effects, on other species in those systems. It's hard to determine exactly what's at risk by analyzing these trends. But I think we can all agree that the value of mule deer, of all American wildlife, is incalculable. And since we're part of this ecosystem too, this earth and the habitat that mule deer occupy, where does that leave us, the human species? Can humans thrive in a habitat that's incapable of sustaining the wild animals in our charge?
The seasonality of nature in the West is gripping. I watch with equal wonder as waterfowl stage for their southern journeys in the fall. And colorful wildflowers begin to pepper mountainsides as the snow departs in the spring. From mountain wildflowers to insects, predators to deer, the diverse habitats here all interrelate, existing in a constant state of flux, shifting as the seasons do. And much like the physical changes that these environments undergo, the animals that inhabit these wild places each possess their own intrinsically fascinating stories. Stories that are largely dictated by seasonal changes. When winter settles in and the snow begins to fall in the mountains, the land takes on a new character. Fields that were once veritable buffets for mule deer can all of a sudden seem barren, devoid of any life-giving forage. The once numerous buds and forbs are no longer plentiful, and the animals' diets make shifts to accommodate for the seasonal transition. Winter can be tough for all living creatures, and as the snow deepens, the difficulty of traveling from food source to food source begins to take its toll. The mule deer begin their yearly migration to lower elevations. Relentless, brutal cold temperatures make this an extremely difficult time of the year for the deer, where surviving is a full-time job. Competition for quality winter range and finding areas with little or no stress is extremely important for their survival and becoming harder all the time. Consequently, the biggest, strongest, healthiest deer such as dominant does exclude the truly needy individuals, usually fawns, from the food. The does and fawns stick close to food, cover, and water at this time, especially during severe winters, where every little bit of movement is conserved to increase their chances of survival until vegetation greens up in the spring. Nothing is easy for the mule deer and other wildlife this time of the year. Mule deer bucks begin to undergo an amazing transformation each January. As the mature bucks seek solitude, their testosterone and fat reserves are now as low as they will be all year. When these levels hit bottom, it causes a layer of cells called osteoclasts to weaken the base by absorbing calcium from the antlers. Irritated by this transition, the bucks will begin to try and knock their antlers off in numerous ways, raking on shrubs or trees, and even sparring. Oftentimes, the bigger, more mature bucks will cast their antlers first, while younger bucks may still pack them weeks later. Immediately after casting their antlers, they will begin the process of growing a new set. It's hard not to feel a complex kinship with predators. Our relationship with these animals is mesmerizing. Humans have both hated and revered predators since the beginning of time. Rich oral traditions from numerous native cultures tell of the might, power, speed, and awe of these animals, whose primary goal is killing and feeding on prey. Mule deer have many predators to watch out for throughout the changing seasons, from mountain lions and coyotes, to bobcats and black bears, to wolves, and even grizzly bears. An average adult lion will kill a deer or elk every nine to 12 days. That's an average of 36 deer and elk per year per lion. And coyotes 
are known to kill more fawns than anything else across North America. The average mortality age of a deer is anywhere from one and a half to three and a half years old. In captivity, that average increases to 16 years old. Wilderness can be cruel. Most deer die from starvation, predation, and cold. A peaceful death in nature rarely exists. In the past, I've watched predators stalk and kill their prey. And whenever I've encountered this, I've noticed there's this inherent need to anthropomorphize the encounter. We tend to pick a good guy and a bad guy, wanting or believing that one of these animals is morally superior to the other. But these predators, like us humans, are eating to survive. People have very intense emotional attachment and valuations placed on predators, more in fact than almost any other species. A simple idea, take some predators out and we'll have more mule deer for us, is not necessarily true in many cases. It's really difficult to make uh, broad brush sweeping generalizations about the relationship of, of predator populations on prey fluctuations because every situation is different depending on, on what animals you've got there and the quality of the habitat. Predators can be present in a system and take many uh, prey animals and never uh, be associated with a major decline in the population. We have to know something about where the prey population is relative to its carrying capacity. If one is getting the impression that the process is building to an ever more complex one, then we're moving somewhere here in this discussion because that's exactly where we have to get to be able to understand what goes on between predators and prey. No matter what, the predators need to be managed, just like the mule deer and the elk and other wildlife species, to ensure a healthy balance for wildlife populations and for the habitats they call home. Neither predator nor prey can live sustainably or healthfully without the other. As the snow lines recede up the mountain, spring begins to show its vibrant colors across the western landscape. Rainfall and snow melt during this time contribute to an explosion of budding wildflowers, grasses, shrubs, and most importantly for the mule deer, summer forage. Feeling the heat from the sun and steadily increasing food supply, the animals will move slowly through the terrain they haven't seen since spring of last year, taking in the sun as they go. Animals on a higher nutrition plane are generally more physically fit and better able to evade predation, survive and reproduce longer than those consuming inadequate forage. This phenomenon of, of mule deer moving up an elevation and accessing a forage patch when plants are just greening up and then moving on to the next one, we call that surfing the green wave. And, and the idea is that you know, the green wave is like the wave of spring moving up the mountain. And the sort of front of that wave is when plants are just greening up. And that's when they're the most nutritious to mule deer. And they, they, they feed on it when it's the sort of highest quality for them. It's sort of like the spring salad mix, really nutritious, low in fiber, high in protein, great deer food. It's essentially a way that these animals extend their exposure to spring, extend the length of time that they can access the fresh green grass. And if you think about that, there's a huge benefit to, to surfing because you get to feed all along the way on the best food. And if you compare that to a resident animal that just stays in one place and the wave of spring comes and just moves past them, they've got this really short time when they can access the great food and then it's gone. And so, you know, the migratory animals are basically chasing that food very successfully on up the mountain and continue to get great forage all spring long. In the valleys below, 
the mule deer does are going through an amazing process that happens every spring. As the newborn fawns begin to arrive, one by one, With around a 200-day gestation period, the fawns will spend the summer with their mothers and wean in the fall after about 60 to 75 days. Does will usually give birth to two fawns, although if it's their first time having a fawn, they usually have just one. They're often born in the open in order to avoid opportunistic predators such as the coyotes. Equipped with temporary spots as a natural camouflage, they'll begin a long journey of evading predators and learning their migration routes. I grew up in a small mountain town that was built on ranching, a place where agriculture played a role in everyone's lives. But because of its natural beauty and recreational opportunities, it's seen an amazing amount of growth in my lifetime. The high land prices make subdividing ranches an appealing alternative for many landowners. More people results in more roads and more infrastructure. What used to be wide swaths of unbroken landscape becomes fragmented into smaller and smaller pieces. It's not an uncommon story. While habitat loss and habitat fragmentation are not the only threats facing mule deer, they are quite likely the greatest. Habitat loss is an easy concept to understand. Less viable habitat for mule deer means less mule deer while we've always understood habitat fragmentation to be a problem, it's not until recently that we've begun to discover just how damaging fragmentation can be to mule deer populations. We've always known mule deer migrate, but they were just thought of as uh, maybe these conveyor belts that move animals from one seasonal range to another. And what we've learned in recent decades is that uh, these aren't just conveyor belts. They're actually a series of stopover sites where mule deer spend weeks and months. What's become apparent is that migration is a critical habitat, just like winter range and just like summer range. It's an important part of their annual nutritional cycle, and it's one we need to pay close attention to. Researchers with the Wyoming Migration Initiative are at the forefront of studying mule deer migratory habits. With the use of GPS collars, They've been tracking and mapping mule deer movements in an effort to provide a resource to preserving these corridors. Created the migration initiative to sort of do the mapping and then get the maps into the hands of the people who want to do the work on the ground. I think what we've seen is that when you have those maps of the migration corridors, there's actually a lot you can do. There are different types of barriers that mule deer can encounter. Small amounts of human development won't always stop the mule deer, but they will move through it quickly, missing out on the nutritional benefits of a vital stopover point. When housing and energy developments reach a certain intensity, they can sever the migration completely. It's not surprising that roads and fences can become insurmountable obstacles for mule deer, sometimes at a deadly cost. They've recently discovered the longest mule deer migration ever to be recorded. The Red Desert to Hoback migration covers 150 miles one way and takes up to four months to complete. Which raises the question, how is it possible for a mule deer to so faithfully follow the same path over such a great distance year after year? They've discovered that mule deer's migration ability is not innate. It's learned and passed down from mother to fawn. Because these animals have incredible spatial memory. And when they learn a migration route from their mom, that's the migration route they use for their life. So imagine being born on summer range and then learning your migration route backwards in the fall. And then you make that same migration by yourself exactly the same way as you learned it backwards with your mom. It's impressive. 
Very rarely do we see mule deer switching routes or changing routes. And that's very interesting from a conservation perspective. If we can identify that route and lots of animals use it, if we conserve it, we're conserving that population. The problem is we sever those routes. Those animals have very low capacity to find a new route. It's exciting, they have such great memory, but it's also a limitation as well. It's their ability to be plastic and try new things. If we lose a migration, one thing we're losing is the number of animals that the landscapes can support will go down. So the biggest thing we're gonna see is just less animals. If we lose a migration and a generation goes by, no animals in that population will know that migration route anymore. We're losing generations of knowledge, of information, of where those greener pastures are for those deer. The maps that the Wyoming Migration Initiative are creating have already led to real-world change in protecting migration corridors. The process can be complex, however. These migration routes cross a variety of different land ownership, from private land to BLM, Forest Service, and state land. Recently, Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke released a migration order that many say helps bring attention to the issue. So Secretarial Order 3362 essentially calls on interior agencies to better map and manage and, and conserve big game migration corridors and winter ranges, uh, specifically focusing on mule deer, pronghorn, and elk habitat. You know, the Secretarial Order today uh, addresses what matters in conservation is corridors, wildlife corridors. You know, we've seen challenges with urban sprawl, and to make sure we look at wildlife corridors and, and protect them through coordination, through being a advocate uh, rather than an adversary of the federal government. That means working with landowners, working with state entities, working with all the federal departments to make sure in the long term that we identify and we protect those wildlife corridors, which results in a healthy population. If we sever these migration lifelines for mule deer, we're losing an essential part of mule deer habitat. I've no doubt that the continued study of migration will play a large role in protecting these vital corridors for mule deer into the future. To, as a researcher, trying to uncover these, these the processes and how these animals migrate is just fascinating because if we can just understand what is going on in these animals' brains that allows them to make these long distance movements, if we can do that, we'll be better off in the future restoring migrations that we've already lost and keeping the few that we have left. Wildlife management can be an emotionally charged issue, but the key to an honest discussion about conservation is having a wealth of science-based evidence to draw from. Our understanding of mule deer comes from a lot of sources. History provides us with context, while science provides us with data about what's happening in the present both of which are critical in our greater understanding of the animals in their habitats. Summer brings new elements to the lives of mule deer. As water begins to dry up, those verdant spring greens give way to the yellows and browns of summertime. The deer relocate to find forage that fits their needs and summertime comprises the most abundant and varied food sources available. Some of these deer have keyed in on specific foods, depending on their predominant habitat. These might include pinyon juniper or sagebrush, for instance. Either way, feeding and good nutrition takes up nearly all of their lives. In the summer season, most of the buds and shrubs hold enough moisture to keep the animals hydrated, helping them avoid water holes and seeps where predators can lurk. In contrast to overall mule deer population decreases, there is a habitat where mule deer numbers are thriving. 
the urban and suburban habitat. You know, the towns are essentially in the winter range of those herds. In general, you know, when we have sort of wild landscapes, the animals need to migrate off of the winter range and, and head up into the higher country to get the fresh green grass that's going to allow them to put on fat during the winter. But if there's an irrigated crop or even an irrigated lawn on their winter range, then, you know, maybe they go and use that instead. And then that creates a few source animals and then they're successful and their, their numbers grow. The behavior of sticking around the town sort of is passed on from mother to young and so then you get the development of these resident mule deer that, that are living around towns. They can reach pretty high numbers and become a problem. Part of the problem is that we tend to disagree on the definition of food. But while having your prized magnolias turned into a snack can be distressing, when deer wander into the road, the results can be disastrous. The Insurance Institute for Highway Safety estimates that there are more than 1.5 million deer vehicle collisions each year, resulting in over 1 billion in vehicle damage, tens of thousands of injuries, and 150 deaths. In recent years, organizations like the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources and the Mule Deer Foundation have turned to a novel approach. The Urban Deer Relocation Program captures urban deer and moves them to an area that can support them. For me, it starts the night before. We go out and bait them. Um, the next morning, we go get them out as early as possible. Um, approach the trap, uh, grab a hold of the, the animal in the best way possible. We hobble them. We blindfold them to calm them down. We lay them on tarps to get them over. We test everything. We ear tag them for pesticides. We um, give them vaccinations to help with pesticides. It's a lot of work, and not every deer is going to be a successful transplant, but some will, and those numbers can quickly make a difference. We're up to okay. uh, almost 200 deer right now that we've moved out of the city this year. Uh, last year during the trapping season, we moved 211 deer. Um, and then we had 36 the year previous. If we move them and they have those babies on the mountain and not in the neighborhoods, is that those babies are now mountain deer and not urban deer. That's how I gauge our success. They need space. They need to be able to be out there and be, be deer. And they don't need to be born in neighborhoods. They need to be on the mountain. But it's not cheap. It costs roughly $800 per deer. And it requires a lot of volunteer labor. But every fawn that's born into the wild, instead of the suburbs, is a big step in ending the cycle of urban deer. Autumn. When the aspens begin to turn color, and the fields and grains in the valleys are nearly all dried and brown, marks the time many of us look forward to. Hunters prepare all year for this season. Sometimes the anticipation of opening day seems to consume more time than the actual hunt itself. Preparation, scouting, planning, and more scouting lead up in a way that we all seem to enjoy. Despite the work it entails, and as the seasons get closer, so does the rut the major breeding time for deer and other ungulate species. Mule deer rut in the Rocky Mountain West tends towards the months between late October and December. Their exact timing, though, can drastically fluctuate year to year, latitude to latitude, and even with the weather and available nutrition. Does will begin a roughly 200-day gestation period shortly now. And for both, in what seems like a constant struggle, the hunt for high-quality forage takes on a new meaning as upcoming winter months will require males and females to carry adequate fat storage to get them through the coldest, most challenging part of the year. Both does and bucks can and will breed numerous times over the course of the rut. Bucks in particular tend to locate multiple groups of does during the season, 
following closely behind those in estrus. Larger, older bucks will usually do the majority of breeding, though younger bucks will occasionally make a challenge. During the peak of the rut, the most dominant testosterone-charged bucks will often fight in competition for females' attention. These battles can become aggressive as the sharply tined antlers ram, gorge, and occasionally lock together in long, bloody engagements. These sights, awe-inspiring to watch, can be gruesome. They don't always have a fairy tale ending either. In rare instances, antlers can lock, posing a deadly situation for both animals. A brutal reminder that the stakes for these creatures are always high. As a television host and producer, a big part of my job is marketing my brand. And in the digital age, that means social media. A lot of social media. I put a great deal of thought into how I'm representing my brand in the sport of hunting. And I get a lot of feedback. Most of it's really encouraging, but there's always a certain amount of negativity as well. It's hard not to be taken back when someone attacks your way of life. While it can be tempting to lash back, I have to remind myself that there's an actual person on the other end of those comments. They just see life through a different lens than I do. You don't have to have a degree in marketing to create a positive presence, but you do have to approach every interaction with respect for other viewpoints. Not everyone comes from a hunting background, and I'm constantly asking myself, how will the images and messages I'm putting out into the world be interpreted by someone who's never been exposed to hunting? Am I representing my passion in a way that's positive and welcoming? Hunters are a very small part of the population. Approximately 4.5% of the U.S. population hunts. That makes every hunter a brand ambassador of the hunting heritage. The actions of every single hunter have an impact on the hunting brand. The unavoidable, unassailable truth is that the responsibility to make sure that hunting is presented and represented in the best possible way, that responsibility falls to the hunting community. The idea that hunting is a God-given right is not new nor are the arguments against it. But regardless of how strongly you feel about hunting or how ingrained it is in your way of life, it can still be taken away. There has never been a time in the history of hunting where recreational hunting has been under such absolute scrutiny and where society has so clearly and so strenuously demanded a response to convince them of its remaining relevance and validity in a modern society. The fate of hunting ultimately sits with the 95.5% that don't hunt. Obviously, there's a small percentage of people that will never be comfortable with hunting in any fashion. But the majority, in the middle, that don't feel strongly about it one way or the other, their approval or disapproval is based on what they see and hear from the small amount of people that do hunt. Every time I get ready for a hunt, every time I walk into the woods, I experience a deep gratitude for the opportunity to connect with nature and provide my family with healthy, organic protein. It's a gift and a privilege that hunters need to examine closely in order to better explain to others why we do what we do. I just spotted a big, old, heavy horn, mature buck. 
bedded like 200 yards. A modern society made up of people who have different values, who primarily live in urban centers, who have a different and evolving views of animals, who have never killed animals in their life, who never were raised on farms. Hunters have to explain to this new community of values and cultures why the activity that they engaged in, the willful pursuit and sometimes the killing of one of these amazing animals, why that has a place in modern society. There's an unavoidable amount of violence that comes with being an omnivore. It involves taking a life. But for the majority of the population, personally pulling the trigger isn't necessary to be a meat eater. It's not something they have to come to terms with, and some may not want to. Their support is very much dependent on what the motivation of the hunter is and what happens to the animal after its death and during its death. The modern public wants to know that we are conservationists. The modern public wants to know that the hunter cares about wildlife in a deep and profound and personal way. The enjoyment of the death of the animal, the, the showing of animals wounded and, and in pain, all of those kinds of things, that needs to be expunged from our record starting now everywhere. This public wants the animal to be treated fairly in the hunt. They want the animal to die as quickly and humanely as possible. And they want to see that animal utilized to the maximum, including fundamentally for that animal to be consumed. This is not my opinion. This is the evidence that has been presented over decades of surveys of the American public I've talked with many hunters about what they feel at the culmination of a hunt, and it's different for everyone. Though universally, we all seem to share feelings of gratitude, thankfulness, and a somber understanding that this action, this undertaking, is nothing less than spiritual. Montana, public land mule deer. You know, this is just a testament to the hard work that the Mule Deer Foundation and its members, and looking after these deer and making sure they have what they need when they need it through the changing seasons. For me, hunting is about so much more than the inevitable outcome. It's about spending time with friends and family. There's this intangible bond that takes place when we share moments in nature with our children and our elders. The time I get to spend passing along my hunting knowledge and my experience in the outdoors with my children is strengthening in ways that are hard to put into words. And it's about the food, a subject that strikes a chord with everyone. Food is one of our strongest ties to each other as humans, past, present, and future. It's something so universal, so binding. When I sit down to share a meal that I played an active role in procuring, it makes me really proud. I enjoy being a provider. I enjoy being able to share healthy, humane, free-range meat with people that are close to me. I don't feel guilty or ashamed for my way of life, but I do try to consider the impact my story has on the larger population and on the hunting brand. When we become so focused on the outcome, we miss the high points in the journey to get there. Could not be more pleased. Thank you. Connecting with nature in an intentional way has taught me a lot about myself and the place I inhabit.
It's in these moments that I reflect on how intertwined we are in the animal world. We are all part of the same ecosystem in which each part depends on the other for survival. When one part of the ecosystem is thrown off balance, the entire system suffers. It's not about putting things back the way they were or even keeping things exactly the same because that goal is simply not attainable. It's about ensuring that ecosystems are as plentiful and diverse as possible. That will benefit mule deer and mankind. As Edmund Burke said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Worst thing that can happen is for everyone to be apathetic and not really care. Once, once people stop caring about what happens to mule deer and what happens to the natural environment, then we're gonna lose everything. So what's the first step? Get involved. Not only can you make a difference, you'll probably have a far greater impact than you could ever realize. You gotta get involved. The worst thing you can do is do nothing. They're really, really amazing animals. And the more and more you're involved with them, the more and more you appreciate them. Make sure that you are involved in having wildlife as part of your quality of life and that you care and have the passion to, to give the resources, the time, and the energy to make sure that that happens. It's a species that's woven into the fabric of, of Western society, and, and if we care about it, we're gonna have to stay engaged and, and make sure we preserve what we have. Public lands belong to the people and not the government, but it takes everyone to be on the same page and work in the common goal. All those out there who treasure mule deer and black-tailed deer or are inspired to see their existence into the future. Do everything you can to give your knowledge, experience, whatever financial ability that you have to give. Help the Mule Deer Foundation. Help us help them. And the best part, the ripple effect of those actions and contributions can reach far beyond our mortal selves. Like the conservationists of Teddy Roosevelt's era, we can be part of protecting mule deer for generations to come. <laughs>